Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and I'm back here at the West Shore Sportsman's Association. And my subject today are the most beautiful and most elegant revolvers that Colt ever made. The Richards Conversions of the 1860 Army Revolver. So let's talk a little bit about the history of these bad boys, and then we'll load them up and see what they can do. You know, guns are, of course, they're machines. They're practical tools made to do a job. But that doesn't mean they can't also be beautiful. And Colt has had some beautiful firearms over its history. I, I think even non-shooters would recognize the intrinsic beauty of a Colt Single Action Army or of a Colt Python. But to me, the most elegant, most beautiful revolver that Colt ever produced was the cartridge conversion of the 1860 Army Revolver, uh, known as the Richards Conversion. Now, there are two models of these. And today we're going to examine both of them. We'll shoot both of them. And, um, and let's talk about the history. Now, Roland White, who was a Colt employee, was granted a patent for a revolver with a bored through cylinder. Though it did not take a metallic cartridge. And in fact, it had a box magazine. And his revolver was impractical. It should never have been patented. In fact, the only prototype made of it failed. Uh, and he shouldn't have had a patent for a number of reasons. For instance, prior to his filing his patent, there were already successful revolvers being manufactured, patented, and shot in Europe, which is why he never got a worldwide patent. He only had a patent in the United States. So the U.S. Patent Office should have rejected his application, but they didn't. And the fact that they didn't had wide-ranging effects in the American firearms industry. So Roland White's patent went into effect in 1854, and it effectively tied up the American handgun market until 1869, because no one could make a revolver with a board-through cylinder unless they were able to license Roland White's patent, which really halted a lot of firearms development. Now, the only company that was willing to do that was Smith & Wesson. And Smith & Wesson produced 22-rim uh, fire and 32-rim fire small frame guns. And they licensed the Roland White patent, and they did it pretty intelligently, because it turns out Roland White was a terrible businessman, along with being a terrible inventor. So his contract with Smith & Wesson called for him to defend... Uh, every infringement on the patent, which means he was in court quite a bit at his own expense. And yeah, he was not making a fortune off the guns. Because Smith & Wesson was only paying 25 cents per revolver as a royalty uh, to White. But it stopped anyone else from developing basically cartridge gun technology, metallic cartridge gun technology. Uh, because in order to do it, they would have had to have licensed the patent now from Smith & Wesson and Roland White. And that was just a no-go for everybody. So Smith & Wesson ended up having the cartridge world to itself, and it really didn't capitalize on the desire of the military to have effective fighting weapons. Now, they sold a lot of 22s and 32s to Army officers, don't get me wrong. Uh, but they were not making a heavy 44 caliber Army revolver for brass cartridges. They, they didn't do that until 1868. And they really should have, because there would have been a tremendous demand for it. I mean, we can see what happened when the Spencer carbine was adopted 
uh, it was a game changer. And it would have been probably the same thing if Smith & Wesson had come out with the 44 American, <clears throat> pardon me, in 1860, but they did not. Now, Colt was unwilling to pay the fees to license that patent. <clears throat> pardon me. But as it turns out, Remington was not unwilling. And that's because Kitteridge uh, brought them to a deal with Smith & Wesson because Kitteridge had bought a thousand new model army revolvers that he wanted converted to cartridges so he could distribute them and sell them. He went to Smith & Wesson and they said, you know, we're not competent to uh, convert these revolvers. You should go to Remington to do that and Remington can negotiate with us for a royalty, which they did and everybody was happy and Remington got a jump on the cartridge market. But Colt was willing to wait until the patent expired in 1869, which, which they did. Though, of course, they had been working on cartridge conversions since the end of the Civil War. Now, in 1869, when the patent expired, they were getting ready to launch a conversion that was designed by Charles B. Richards, who was an employee of Colt's. He was their plant superintendent. And he had really an ingenious design because what Colt wanted to do, and I should point out, we call these guns cartridge conversions, but very few of them were actual conversions of percussion guns. Most of them were newly manufactured. But what Colt wanted to do was to use up the stockpile of 1860 Army cap and ball parts that they had built up during the Civil War. So they wanted to make a cartridge firing gun that used as many of those parts as possible. Just because that was a sunk cost to them. Well, I should probably explain the sudden shift in venue. Uh, because I was filming at the West Shore Sportsman's Association, and things were going pretty well. But uh, somebody occupied the adjoining range to me and you know, began to unleash the sounds of freedom. And I just couldn't get a word in edgewise uh, between all the gunfire. And uh, not that I mind them doing that. That's, that's what the club is there for. So, I came back here to, to my shop. Now, unfortunately, you know, this is not Hollywood, and I don't have access to a sound stage where I can control everything that happens. So, even when I'm here, we're occasionally going to be surprised by the sound of somebody turning on a faucet and water running through the pipes or the HVAC system. I apologize for that. There's really not much I can do about it. Uh, I do miss being able to film at Duelist Den, which was a nice quiet place to do long narration. But even there, sometimes we have an airplane fly overhead or a car drive by, so, you know, nothing is perfect. Uh, maybe someday I'll have a Hollywood soundstage. But let's get back to Richard's conversions. So I think I was saying that uh, these were not really conversions of existing cap and ball revolvers, they were newly manufactured revolvers, where Colt's desire, corporately, was to use as many parts of the 1860 Army as possible because they had a pretty good stockpile built up and they were building 1860 Army cap and ball revolvers for the Civil War. So, that's what the Richards conversion did. Now, there were newly manufactured parts. In fact, all of the cylinders, the cartridge cylinders, you know, were newly manufactured. Uh, 
the the major manufactured part besides the cylinders, so two parts really, uh, was the conversion ring. And for that they machined away a good portion of the recoil shield and they bolted this conversion ring on that had, in the case of the first model Richards, a frame mounted spring loaded firing pin, something that we associate with the 20th century, uh, but here it is you know, in the mid 19th century very successfully implemented. Uh, the ring had an integral rear sight uh, and it was kind of interesting because it actually had a lip around it that fully enclosed the rear of the cylinder uh, which, which kind of functions like uh, countersunk chambers for the cylinder heads. So, And these were balloon head cases so if a case ruptured the gases would be contained in that lip that ran right around the cylinder. Very interesting. So that was the part that actually converted it along with the cylinder to a cartridge firing, you know, brass cartridge firing revolver. The other really neat part was the ejection assembly. And this is one of the things that makes the uh, 1860 Richards conversion so elegant because it maintains those beautiful lines of the cap and ball 1860 revolver. It doesn't just have a bolted on ejection rod. This ejection rod is beautifully machined and it actually goes into the hole that accommodated the cap and ball rammer uh, where it's secured by a screw uh, that used to secure the cap and ball rammer to the gut. And it's just a beautiful piece of engineering, quite expensive. And, you know, it was later done away with in favor of the Richards Mason ejector, which is just a tube that's bolted on the side of the gun, not, not nearly as elegant. So those are the newly manufactured parts uh, that you can see externally. The only newly manufactured action part is they changed the hand from a one-step hand, where just the top of the hand engaged the ratchet of the cylinder, and you know, rotated the cylinder around, right, uh, for each chamber. They went to a two-step hand, so basically where it looks like this, you know, like my fingers and thumb, where it lifts it part way with the top, and then it catches it with the bottom, and lifts it the rest of the way. And that's actually a much more mechanically efficient way of doing it. Uh, and they continued that same design into the Colt Single Action Army. So, those were the parts that were newly manufactured to make a Richards conversion, particularly first model Richards. I'll explain the difference between first model and second model uh, conversions later. Now, I said for the most part, these were guns that were newly manufactured. They were not previously cap and ball 1860 Army revolvers. However, the Army started the ball rolling with an order for 1,200 actual conversions, where they sent Colt 1,200 cap and ball 1860 armies, and Colt converted them to first model Richards cartridge firing guns. And uh, of course they did that by throwing the cylinders away, making new cylinders, making the conversion rings, machining the recoil shield, uh, and putting that on, machining the barrel to take the new ejector assembly, the whole bit. But the base gun was an actual Army 1860 Colt cap and ball revolver. And those were the first conversions that Colt did, the first Richards that Colt actually turned out. Now, in addition to those 1,200 that got converted, Colt bought about 5,000 newly manufactured uh, Richards Type 1 conversion revolvers. And the conversions they had done and the Richards that they bought were all issued to various units uh, for field testing. And some units were fully equipped with them. And the results were quite positive from the Army. The, the Army liked the Richards conversion. Now, just about all of those Richards conversions were retired by the Army in favor of the, you know, Model 1873 single-action Army revolver uh, by 1880. 
there may have been a few that were around longer. Now, we know that the 10th Cavalry, which is one of the famous Buffalo Soldier outfits where, you know, we had uh, African-American cavalry troopers, uh, they were issued First Model Richards revolvers, as were their Apache scouts. And they may have hung on to those longer than some of the other units. I'm, I'm trying to, to pin that down. But we know that they had them uh, in the 78, uh, 1878 to 1880 time frame. So anyway, if you're interested in the Buffalo Soldiers and you're reenacting them, uh, this is a good gun, good gun to carry. A Colt finished work on the Army's uh, Richards conversions in 1872, and they immediately started turning these out for the civilian market, where they were quite popular. And one of the best photographs of the 1860 uh, conversions, first model Richards conversions, in civilian hands uh, is a picture of the Kinney Gang holding these guns in a studio photograph. And this picture has been seen everywhere. You know, it, it really is quite popular. It's usually labeled as New Mexican, uh, New Mexico rustlers uh, photographs. And the reason for that is because Kenny, uh, the reason for that is because John Kenny, who had been an army sergeant in, in the cavalry, uh, and he got out and he started a ranch near Mesilla, New Mexico, but he did not become, let's say, a legitimate rancher, right? When his ranch became a haven for rustlers and hold-up men and every sort of desperado around. So it's, it's kind of like the, uh, say, the cowboy outfit outside of Tombstone, Arizona uh, in the 1880s. So the Kinney Gang was notorious in New Mexico. In fact, they rode with the Dolan faction in the Lincoln County War. Uh, they were notorious rustlers. So Kenny and his gang, they were known for, let's say, hijinks. Uh, they were not exactly settled law-abiding individuals, as you've seen, right? So in 1875, they got involved in a major bar fight with cavalry troopers from Fort uh, Fort Selden. And in the course of that fight, they got their butts handed to them. Uh, John Kenny and, and his boys took a whooping and they were physically thrown out of the saloon. Now instead of going off to lick their wounds, they drew their revolvers and they started shooting in that saloon indiscriminately. And they killed two trout cavalry troopers, they killed two civilians, uh, and they wounded several other people. It was a mess. Now, did they use Colt Richards conversions in that fight? I don't know. But given that it was in 1875, and the civilian market had not seen hardly any single-action army revolvers yet, I would say the odds were pretty good that they were armed with uh, their Richards conversions when they had that little fracas, right? So, uh, kind of puts that picture in perspective. By the way, Kenny got arrested, spent three years in prison, and when he came out, totally turned his life around and was an upstanding, law-abiding citizen until he died, I think, in 1916. I mean, it uh, was quite a while. So, just shows, I guess there is some, some hope for the wicked. The first model Richards were made from 1871 until 1877, 1878. We don't really have great dates on when they changed over. And at that point, they changed over to a transitional model, which is known as a second model, Richards Mason. And my guess is that they were out of the Richards conversion rings by then, and they decided not to manufacture any more. Uh, so they went to the Type 2 Richards conversion ring, 
which does not have the integral spring-loaded firing pin. Instead, it uses a hammer-mounted firing pin, kind of like the later single-action army. Though, of course, this is kind of a splice job uh, onto the single-action uh, 1860 Captain Ball's hammer. Because the first model Richards had the front of the hammer cut off to strike you know, that integral firing pin uh, in the conversion plate. So now we've got a, a firing pin that's basically riveted uh, into the nose of the hammer. And we don't have that beautiful rear sight that you see on the first model Richards conversions. Now we're back to using that notch cut in the hammer nose from the cap and ball revolver as a rear sight. However, it still had those lovely Richards uh, ejection assemblies. And so it's known as a transitional model. because this was only made 1877-1878 and uh, I think it was only made probably until they used up all of those ejector assemblies they had and then they went to the Richards Mason conversion which just used a bolted on tube ejector uh, which of course is less expensive I'm sure so I, I think that the Type 2 was really uh, just using up some of those ejectors that they had on hand before they went to a completely cheaper to manufacture uh, model of, of uh, cartridge conversion. Like I, I told you the first model Richards have a conversion ring that completely overlaps the back of the cylinder to provide some protection. Uh, the second model Richards ring does away with that so it has no rear sight it has no integral firing pin and it does not overlap so it makes it a much cheaper assembly to be able to manufacture there's no doubt about that and of course that led in to the Richards Mason army conversions that followed I don't own uh, original Colt Richards cartridge conversions. I wish I did, but I don't. So what I'm shooting here today are replicas. And I have a replica first model Richards, which was made by Army San Marco in the late 1990s, around 1997-98, I think they started this. And my gun is actually a prototype, uh, which I got from Cimarron as a test and evaluation gun to do an article for Guns of the Old West back in probably 98. Uh, and I liked it so much I kept it because I wanted a cartridge conversion. And I had had a couple of failed attempts to have uh, a custom one made at that point uh, of, of the Richards. Uh, so I got that from Cimarron, kept it, loved it. Uh, it differs from the originals in one major way. And that is that the conversion ring was not manufactured to enclose the rear of the cylinder. And I truly wish it was. I, I understand the expense, uh, but I'd have been willing to pay it to get an accurate conversion ring. So you can see the gap between the cylinder and the ring. 
uh, just like you could on the second model Richards or on a Colt Single Action Army or anything like that. And that really is the major difference. Uh, uh, everything else is, is pretty much the same except the rear of the cylinder is a little bit bigger than the original. It doesn't have as much of a step as it should. Now, Army San Marco has been out of business since the late 1990s. And nobody is making a first model Richards revolver. Anyway, so if you want one, you're going to have to find it on the used gun market. And, uh, and you won't be getting mine because I'm not getting rid of it. Uh, because I just think they are the most elegant cartridge conversions going. But if you want a newly manufactured gun, Uberti is making a replica of the second model Richards conversion, which I also have. And that is pretty close to the original. It's got the right, uh, right ejector assembly. It, of course, has the more simplified conversion plate of the second model Richards. Uh, with the rear sight on the hammer nose, so you've got all of that stuff going for it. Uh, now, the Army San Marcos model is actually chambered for 44 Colt, and I'll talk about 44 Colt in a minute. Uh, whereas the second model Richards, the Uberti replica, is chambered for 44 Special. And that's kind of a boon because 44 Colt is a pain to load. Uh, even in the modern version, which uses the inside lubricated bullets, it's kind of like it's like a 44 Special that's a good tenth of an inch shorter. Uh, but having the gun chambered for 44 Special certainly makes it easier to load for. In order to do that, they had to make the cylinder bigger. So dimensionally, the Uberti Richards, second Richards, is a little bit bigger than the originals, uh, which could never have accommodated a 44 special rim, uh, because the, that rear of the cylinder uh, on 1860 armies is just too small in diameter to, to do that. So that's the main difference with the Uberti Richards, uh, second model Richards is dimensionally it's a little bit different uh, and I mean really that's not a naked eye thing you know you don't look at it and say aha that's no good so it's an excellent gun and it is available uh, and I enjoy mine so if you're looking if you're looking for one you should be able to find those around at, at the places to carry uh, Roberti so let's talk about the 44 Colt cartridge both the first and second Richards conversions, the, the real ones, the Colt ones, were chambered for the 44 Colt cartridge, uh, which is a cartridge that was uniquely made for the 1860 Army conversions. And I'll bet my eye teeth that Colt would much rather have chambered them for the 44 American cartridge used by the Smith & Wesson because the government was already producing that cartridge because they had bought some Smith & Wesson uh, American guns. But the rims were too big, they would not fit in the back of a Colt cylinder. They would actually overlap, so you couldn't load all the chambers. You could only load three uh, if you used them. So they had to come up with a different cartridge, and they came up with a 44 Colt that had a very small rim, just enough to keep it from dropping through the cylinder. And those, those rounds in the original version used a heel base bullet, you know, where you've got that shank that fits into the cartridge case, and then the actual bullet is the same diameter as the brass case, right? Like a 22 long rifle is today. So these guns, which we call 44s, were actually 45s. They shot uh, 454 inch diameter bullets. Uh, so later, when they produced the single action army in, you know, 45 Colt, 
they were making a more powerful version, but they already had a 45, if you will, uh, with the Richards conversion, though in a, a less powerful package because it had a shorter overall cartridge length. The 44 caliber Colt case, except for the rim, is the same size as the 44 Special, 44 Russian, uh, 44 Magnum family of cases. And it can be reloaded on the same dies with just a different shell holder. You know, it's just that it's, it's a case that falls lengthwise uh, between the 44 Russian and the 44 Special. So, it, it's, it's a, in the modern guns, uh, which use 429 inch bullets, uh, which both of mine do. Um, it's a pretty simple cartridge to load. Uh, of course, I'm shooting mine with black powder, just because I like that. But these replicas are fully modern manufactured firearms that are capable of firing smokeless powder ammunition, as long as it's, you know, standard pressure stuff. I wouldn't use plus P stuff in an open top revolver uh, for fear of, of maybe cracking the forcing cones. Just like I, I would probably stay away from jacketed ammunition in these guns because the forcing cone's not supported by a frame wrapped around it, right? So uh, you have more of a likelihood of cracking one. I'm not saying you will, but I just don't feel comfortable running jacketed bullets uh, through either of these replicas. So other than that, though, they are outstanding guns. And certainly, to my mind, the most elegant revolvers in the Colt lineup, bar none. Uh, these are my favorite guns for, for looks. Um, and let's see what they can do out on the range. Okay, Evil Roy and Hangin' Hack are up to their old tricks. So let's take the first model Richards conversion and see if we can put them back in their place. Maybe not. Well, four out of five, I don't feel great about that. I think we're gonna have to take the second model, Richards, and finish the job. Well, I am definitely getting rusty. Well, that's it. That's our, our look at uh, Colt's cartridge conversion revolvers. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you again probably in two weeks. And until then, bye.